Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today, I'm joined by an adventure. Not just any adventure, but someone who National Geographic has named Adventure of the Year. He's walked across Iceland. He's walked across India. He rode across the Atlantic, unsupported for 45 days from Spain to Barbados. And he spent four years cycling across the world. He is the author of numerous books, including his most recent, Local. He is extremely passionate about encouraging people to search closer than ever before to their homes for nature and wilderness to embark on micro-adventures. Welcome to the Silver Corp Podcast, Alistair Humphreys. Thank you very much for having me. You have quite the list of accolades behind your name. Your books that you've written are inspiring. They get people outside and they do so in a really accessible way. But I really, really want to talk about micro adventures. I want to talk about your new book, but I think I would be absolutely remiss if we didn't touch on a little bit about you and kind of what got you into these grand adventures and what's been pushing you into the term that you coined micro adventures. So if, if we're going to look back a little bit, what's your earliest memory of an adventure that you've been on? Oh, um, I grew up in um, a lovely part of Northern England called the Yorkshire Dales. It's a very beautiful little countryside sort of landscape. And I was quite lucky that the school I went to, say when I was about nine or 10 years old, they forced the entire school, I'm sure this would be highly illegal these days, but they forced the whole school to go and walk this um, 26 mile mountain challenge, the three peaks of Yorkshire. So that's what, about 40 wow. miles walking around the countryside over some hills. Uh, it was, And you had to do it in under 12 hours to get a t-shirt. And I was so proud of that t-shirt. So <laughs> that was my that was my first adventure. But, you know, everyone in my school was doing it. So it wasn't that I was some sort of crazy adventure guy. It was just that I was lucky to grow up in the countryside. And my school made us do stuff like that, I guess. So, um, yeah, that's my first real adventure, I think. Yorkshire, beautiful countryside, beautiful puddings. Uh, what, James Cook? He's from your, he's one of your countrymen there from Yorkshire, isn't he? Grand Explorer. Yep. Yep, Amy Johnson. Is, yes. Amy Johnson, ah. you know about her? Yeah, good, good Yorkshire knowledge. There you go. I, I liked it over there. It's uh, just a, a beautiful area. But uh, what did she do? She flew from England to Australia. She was the Australia, first person to do that. Australia, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, pretty adventurous. So I, you know, what, what is it that drives you? What was it that drove you to go out on these massive grand expeditions that took tons of planning and arguably put your life in, in harm's way? What, what was it that was inside you that was sparking that, that desire? So I, I didn't really do anything particularly adventurous as a kid um, beyond school camping type trips. So it was only really when I got to university that a couple of things happened to me. Um, one, we have like the the reserve army in Britain that um, mm-hmm. is basically a weekend army, essentially. And I joined that uh, mostly because the beer was really cheap and you got paid money to run around the hills. <laughs> um, I had I had no interest in the guns at all. But I really enjoyed running around the hills. And that was the first time in my life that I'd got quite a a buzz out of being pushed really hard and setting high standards and working hard to try and meet those high standards. So I got interested in that sort of physical side of challenging myself in a way that I'd never done before. And then simultaneously to that at university, when I should have been studying, uh, I was mostly reading or when I wasn't drinking beer, I was mostly reading books about travel and adventure and explorers, and I loved all of these things. And those two worlds collided, really, uh, getting me just thinking, 
wow, I really want to set myself a huge physical difficult challenge um, and I really want to go see the world, all these amazing places that I've been reading about. There must be exciting places beyond the shores of Britain. Let's go have a look at it. Um, but like a lot of young people, I didn't have a huge amount of money, uh, but I had plenty of time. And so I decided to go around the world by bicycle. It was uh, it's cheap, it's simple, it's painful, it's slow, it's difficult. It's a brilliant way to see wild places and to talk and communicate with communities and families and individuals who meet along the way. And still, after all the adventuring I've done, I haven't yet found a better way to travel than to put a tent on the back of a bicycle and see how far you can get. So yeah, it was a combination of curiosity and wanting to travel, like a lot of young people, plus a drive to try to prove something to myself in some sort of tough, challenging way. No kidding. Well, when I look at it, so when you say, I can't think of a better way than to throw a tent on the back of a bicycle and travel around, I got to imagine uh, meeting people all over the world, different communities, uh, learning about cultures that are completely foreign to your own and just opening yourself up to an environment that, and, and situations and, and adventures that you might not normally see will just sit on sitting on the couch at home for sure. But that's a very different adventure than getting into a rowboat with a couple of your mates and rowing across the Atlantic. So one, I would think there's a very um, social side to it. And the other one's going to be just, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but dogged determination and your social network is now uh, going to be those few people on that rowboat with you. Does that sound about an accurate description? Yeah, very much so. And so after I'd after I'd gone around the world, I started to start seeking out different kinds of adventurous experience. So hot places, cold places, desert, dry places, oceans, wet places. So trying to get a variety of um, environmental experiences, but also traveling in different ways. So by foot or uh, on skis, pulling a sled or on a rowing boat. So getting different kinds of adventures. And then the third thing is also trying to mix up doing journeys by yourself um, versus doing them with other people. There are pros and cons to traveling alone and traveling with other people. And yeah, in traveling around the world was very much, I was on my own, but it was a shared social experience of every day I was buying bread from the village shop or asking someone for directions or um, and so on. So it's always a, a conversational type experience um, interspersed with areas of remote wilderness. Rowing the Atlantic was just me and three other guys and nothing for 3,000 miles um, of, of empty ocean. So that really became an exercise, as you say, in dogged determination. But also it's very much a human interaction of how do we work together to get the best out of each other and frankly to not want to kill each other and how do I behave <laughs> so that these guys don't want to kill me as well so um, I really enjoyed I mean, traveling by yourself is fantastic for your self de self development your self confidence for knowing yourself the good sides and the bad sides but you can also become a bit of a selfish idiot by just doing that so traveling with other people is a really good way of remembering to be kind to offer kindness and and to accept kindness if someone said to me on the rowing boat al you're looking a bit tired today my natural sort of macho instinct is to say i'm not tired look how tough i am i'm gonna row until i drop which is just dumb and far mm -hmm. more sensible but i personally find much harder is to say Thank you. Thank you for your kindness. I am struggling right now and I'll accept your help and I'll pay that back to you at some point. So it's very, they're very different experiences traveling alone and with other people. And But I think both of them teach you a lot about yourself and about the world. Yeah, that was, that was a, uh, a lesson I learned. I, I wish I could say I learned it early in life, but I didn't. <laughs> the, uh, the whole macho, I'm tough. I can move on. I can keep going. Really, if you've got a large objective that you're trying to meet, being able to pace yourself properly and just give it your all every single day, as opposed to 110% or 120% and burning out in a couple of days. Yeah, that was, um, I remember I was, uh, in hiking some hills over here with a, uh, good friend of mine. He's uh, ex British army and his approach, I'm, 
I'm looking at this guy like he did SAS selection a couple of times and he was about a day away from getting badged when he got uh, injured on uh, on one of his attempts there. But uh, he's like, okay, yeah, no, let's, let's get some food in us. Okay, let's have a tea. Okay, let's make sure we got our jackets on. I'm like, what is this guy? I thought we're supposed to be tough here, right? But we were comfortable and where everybody else was uh, knackered on the side, uh, falling out, we just kept going and going. And we just had a pace that we could maintain day after day. And so that, that little piece of, of a life, le- life lesson I learned very late in life, but what a crucial one if you really want to achieve more. Yeah. And any idiots can be uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Totally. So what advice would you give to somebody who, let's say, and I know I really want to talk about micro adventures, but I, I gotta, I gotta get some of the bigger adventures out of the way. If somebody wanted to embark on one of these two very different types of adventures, let's say the, uh, rowing across the Atlantic, I, I think I read somewhere that you guys didn't bicker there. There wasn't any fights, which I find unfathomable spending 45 days with other people on a boat in these conditions, but uh, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to embark on an adventure like that? Well, probably my my semi serious advice would be don't go do the ocean row. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it's an extremely expensive way to have an adventure, extremely logistically complicated, and a bit of a hassle. And you and you could spend the money much more. Um, much better i think by just getting on your bicycle and pedaling away from your front door or just putting your backpack on and walking out of your front door and just setting off forest gump type style i think mm. i think it's especially for younger people to consider how much money you have available and how you can best spread that into a long adventure so i didn't have very much money for cycling around the world but i just made it last a really long time by living an extremely basic life, essentially eating just instant noodles and banana sandwiches for four years, um, which was, you know, sometimes it's tough, but, or I could have gone to Vegas for a week and uh, drunk champagne for a week. So it's a kind of a choice of, of how to get the best bang for your buck. So I personally would hugely encourage you to go for the, the simple, cheap, adventure and another aspect is that it then is all in your own hands trying to row an ocean unless you're really rich you're gonna have to go out and find sponsors and companies and then you're starting to put your hopes and dreams in other people's hands and it takes Mm. ages and you might fail and all sorts and so I'm a huge believer in just just trying to take responsibility for your own adventures save up as much money as you can work out how much time you have in your life and then don't complain because someone else has got more time and money just appreciate what you've got and do the best that you can with what you've got and do it as soon as you can because life will only get more complicated and uh with more commitments and more ties so just do it do it as soon as you can what is it that drives this passion for adventure that you have i think there are various things driving my adventurous side and they have evolved a lot over the 20 years or so of been doing big adventures. I mean, I'm, I guess that happens just, you just get old, don't you? So your motivations for life change. But so, so if I just talk you quickly through them, I'm, I've, I've mentioned the early ones, which is a curiosity to see the world and a desire to push myself and challenge myself. And then that sort of moved on towards a, uh, a curiosity about learning about different places in the world. Um, and then mo- adventures for me moved on more to about the the joy that I got from encouraging other people to go have adventures. So I do my own adventures and then through those try and encourage people to have adventures of their own. And then more recently, the more recent phase is, is that adventure for me is a way to spend time out in nature, which is good for my uh, body and my soul, physical and mental health, but also is a way to start getting me really connected and caring about nature and the environment and hopefully trying to help do something to to fix the mess that we've got ourselves in. So yeah, my motivations for adventure have evolved a lot over the years. You know, when I was, uh, I think it was grade three, I was diagnosed with ADHD. My family had no idea what to do with me. They were going to ship me off to a uh, uh, 
wherever, someplace it would take me because I was a bit too much of a handful. And then the uh, doctor says, well, maybe you should get this kid checked out. Got diagnosed professionally with ADHD, was put on the highest dosage of Ritalin in the province on an, apparently I was told anyways, on an experimental run to uh, see how this worked. I absolutely hated it. But one thing that I found was being outdoors, being in nature had a just a profound effect on me. And it's something that I encourage of obviously everybody else. And I, I see now they have, um, they talk about, I think it's like green therapy or, or, or I forget what the term is that they use, but, um, ways to cope with ADHD without medication. And a big part of that is just being outside. So that's always been a huge part of me and, and my soul and what, what kind of drives me more out of necessity than anything else more for my own sanity. Um, would you say that that kind of, uh, speaks to you as well? When you grew up, were you one of, did you follow a similar path as myself that you needed the outdoors or did you discover the outdoors and, and what it could do for you? No, I don't think I uh, particularly needed the outdoors as a kid. I enjoyed it when I was doing it, but I would generally quite happily spend as many hours watching TV as I could get away with before my mum threw me out of the house. So, <laughs> so no, so so that aspect didn't apply to me. Although actually, just just this weekend, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a teacher in an elementary school, and they there's an education program called Forest Schools where you do some of the teaching. Mm out in the woods and uh, and she was telling me about a child in the school who really struggles in the normal classroom they, they can't concentrate they're naughty all these sort of uh, issues mm. that may be familiar to you Travis and yet when they get to the outside part to the time in the forest and boom this kid shines they are the superstar mm. they're engaged uh, they know about the birds and the insects and boom 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 and uh, and there's, there's so there's different levels of what success at school can mean I suppose but I, I've come to that side of nature uh, as an adult, really. So now as an adult, I need to get out and run around and burn off some energy. I need to get out in nature just to de-stress myself and to calm down. Um, and and increasingly so, I find that I turn towards just spending time outdoors to just try and slow my soul and get through the stresses of modern life. It's interesting you bring up success. If I were to ask you, and we have success in many different ways, but what would success be to you? Because you're a guy who's got some pretty high ambitions. Clearly, you're driven. You've got a number of different endeavors. Mind you, they seem to follow a similar theme, an underlying theme. What is success to you? Well, success is also a something that is evolved a lot and I've realized that it is a foolish master and a foolish goal to chase because for example cycling around the world one of the re I would come up with a challenge like that thinking I want to do something huge and enormous and if I can just cycle around the world then I'll then people will tell me I'm amazing and I'll feel great about myself and that'll be real success and I go off all the way around the world and I get all the way back home and I then essentially think huh well, I made it around the world, so it can't actually have been that hard. So maybe I should have done something a bit harder. So then I start trying to think of another <laughs> idea. So so trying to chase um, goal-driven success is the route to madness in my experience. Mm. And mu much better is to try and chase the sort of success based on your, your values. So what what's important to me to be someone who spends a lot of time in the outdoors, who encourages people to live adventurously, who tries to do a bit to try and fix some of the environmental issues and and they're the sort of values within me that I'm trying to work towards and if I spend a day doing those then that feels like perhaps a successful day but I'm really I'm really bad at competitive success so for example if I sell a thousand books I don't think oh great I just look on Amazon I see some dude who sold two thousand books and I'm just jealous and angry at that guy so uh, yeah I have to try to just keep it within myself rather than competing with others yeah. So you've got a pretty strong competitive nature. Clearly you've, you're competitive with yourself in, in some of your endeavors that you've been on. Um, how do you, how do you handle that, that natural competition that you feel within yourself? <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Essentially 
although I just said then about competing with other people on books, generally my competitive instincts are just within myself, just trying to push mm. myself and pr prove stuff to myself. And I think I I think maybe I'm just getting old because um, I'm not I'm not nearly as ambitious and driven as I used to be. And I'm much more concerned now with trying to live a life that just feels like it's got some purpose to it. I'm trying to do some good, but generally also that I'm just enjoying my life. And that's a very new concept. Um, until quite recently, I would have thought that someone trying to enjoy themselves was just a wimp and that mm. really what I should be doing is jumping in some ice cold lakes and having a truly miserable time in order to ensure that I was maximally <laughs> alive. But these days I'm quite happy with a, a, a good book and a cup of coffee. You know, I've always liked that, uh, that outlook that uh, success is to be able to enjoy your life and to, to share that enjoyment with others. And people who have reached that point where they know how to enjoy their life, they know what it is that brings them happiness and they're able to share it with others. I, I think that's a pretty good measure of success for anybody. Yeah, you, absolutely. And I, I think I envy people who, that you sometimes meet people who've just got that sorted. And I definitely envy them and work towards it. You know, I don't know if I'm ever going to have that sorted. I, I, I like the, and a friend of mine, he, he would probably, uh, uh, have some words about this. He's like, I don't think life is a journey, but I, I like that journey. However, we want to explain that or describe that the process, being able to enjoy that process is, uh, is so utterly crucial. Like when you say being goal oriented is, um, and always striving for those goals, well, you get there and then what? Well, maybe I. Maybe I need something harder. I, I liken it to cliff jumping. Okay. Kind of scares me. I'm pretty high up. Man, is the water deep enough? I think it was. I threw a rock in. It sounded like it was okay. Let's go. Okay. That was good. Let's do it a couple more times. Now what? Well, let's climb a little bit higher, right? And you keep doing that. And at what point do you stop when you suffer serious injury? Because you don't want to give up, right? You don't want to let your fears get get, the, get a hold of you. So I liken that process of uh, goal chasing to cliff jumping. And maybe we need some of that. Maybe we need those failures to keep pushing us up if they're uh, controlled. But man, there's something to be being able to be content with the process and being content with what you're doing. Yeah, there's no question absolutely. in there. Just a big, long statement. Yeah, that was a long statement. I was about to try and think what to say, but I'll let you ask a question. <laughs> no problem. So you had a <laughs> podcast for a while, which I thought was pretty cool because it's interesting listening to you at your first episode and then listening to you as you progress through and how you get more and more comfortable and the way that the uh, the podcast develops. What was that? Just, just my own personal sort of uh, uh, selfish question here, but what was that process like for you? First of all, I absolutely loved having a podcast and I'm continually trying to work out ways to get it back to life. Uh, essentially, it seemed to me it's just an excuse to find someone I thought interesting and say, hey, please can we hang out together for an hour um, in a way that <laughs> if I didn't have a podcast and just ask people that it would seem a bit creepy and weird. So I love totally. that aspect of it. Um, I mean, and interesting to, that you mentioned the technical change in it I mean the literally the first time I took the microphone out of the packet and press record was when I put it in front of my first guest which is a terrible way to go about the technique but hey ho I, I improved a bit but what I really enjoyed about it was I I just I spent a whole month cycling around Yorkshire this of the, the small county that I grew up in in England and I did this because I'd been all the way around the world but I realized I didn't know very much about home where I'd grown up at all. So I was interested just to go and explore where I lived. And I was also very interested in what living adventurously meant to different people. I had my own ideas that living an adventurous life was a pursuit worth going for. But how did other people approach that same question? So I just went interviewing people who in their different ways were living adventurously. And they were artists or photographers or 
all sorts of various different things. But it was just essentially a really nice chance to chat. But I found it deceptively hard. So I'd prepare my questions and then you ask the guy the first question and they answer and go off in a totally different direction. So then That's in right. my head, I'm trying... I'm trying to hold the microphone in front of the person. I'm trying to read what my second question is. But also in my head, I'm thinking, well, maybe I should go down this new direction because this is really interesting. And by the end of the interview, I was absolutely exhausted. So um, I found it really quite hard to do, but but enjoyable as well. Mm. I've always found the hardest part about recording any podcast is just my introduction. Because I always look at it like if I'm going to have somebody into my house, I don't, I know some podcast host will do this and no judgment, but they'll say, go introduce yourself to the audience. I wouldn't have somebody into my house and say, oh, go introduce yourself to everyone. I'm going to bring them on in and say, this is Alistair. Here's a bit about his background and introduce him to the rest of the group. And I, and I look at the podcast as the same way. Mind you, that sets a tone for the podcast where now the person is like, okay, now I've been introduced. Here's what I got to live up to. And it becomes a, a sort of an interview question answer kind of format and i've always loved the, the the back and forth that we're often able to develop in a podcast where people throw things right back at me and they say well that's a really stupid question let me ask you this right and and that's the the beauty of the podcast i find is is how it can evolve and you, you know i'm previously right before recording this you were on an instagram live and you're with the river trust and talking with them and talking about great joy you've had out in swimming in the different rivers and uh, brings to mind a podcast that you did talking about, I, th I think it was a TED talk that you're going to go talk at or, or some talk in the, uh, in the Netherlands and a taxi driver picks you up and um, you talk him into doing something a little bit crazy. Did you want to talk me through this one? If you remember this? <laughs> yeah, I do remember this episode. So I is, I, um, do quite a lot of talks in different places. And I, so I took the train from London to Amsterdam to go speak at some boring corporate sort of event. Um, but the taxi driver picked me up and he was driving me to the place and it was a hot summer's day. And in the Netherlands, there were a load of canals, at, of course, they're famous for that. But what I noticed as we were driving there, it was a hot summer's day. There were a load of kids and teenagers jumping off the bridges into the canals. And, and I love doing stuff like that. But I was on my way to an important corporate event, sensible guy. And I was with a taxi driver. So I was like, oh, oh, well. And then after a bit, I was like, come on, I really want to go jump in a canal. Not least of all, because the topic that I was speaking about at these events was, hey, just get on and live your life, be adventurous, blah, blah, blah. And there was I just mm. sitting in a taxi being lazy. So I said to this guy, can we stop at the next canal so that I can jump into the canal and he sort of laughed and thought I was a strange but of course you know I'm the client he's the taxi guy so he kind of has to do whatever I want he's like yeah sure so as we're driving towards the next one then I say have you ever jumped in one of these canals he said no no I've never done that before I'm like, right why don't you join me so he's like okay and I was delighted that he was just willing to grasp it and say okay so we stopped the car and we both got out of the car and we just sort of <laughs> had to strip down to our boxer shorts, jump off a fairly high bridge into the canal. It was fantastic. We laughed and uh, I think we did it uh, two or three times. And then we just had to <laughs> get dressed, get back in the car and drive on. And it was a lovely little experience. But, you know, I, I do that sort of thing a lot. So I enjoyed it, but it wasn't that big a deal to me. This guy sent me an email afterwards. Like, this was amazing. And then he sent me an email a year later with a photo of us. Like, wow, do you remember when we did this together? And I just thought that was so fantastic that uh, he'd also really appreciated that and who knows maybe he'd got some other <laughs> clients to go jump in rivers at other points so yeah it was a lovely experience it's got to be one of the most memorable taxi rides i'm sure he's had yeah. i gotta wonder was he still on the clock when he was jumping in or did he turn the clock of the cab <laughs> off when he was jumping <laughs> i hope he was on the clock of his say also <laughs> when uh, when we were about to jump in this guy uh, he's a taxi driver. He had massive muscles and a huge six pack. He made me feel like a real scrawny little wimpy guy <laughs> next to him. <laughs> oh man. You know, that's what it's amazing what we can accomplish in life and the adventures that we can have. If we just open our mind up to being acceptable to them, um, to being open to them. And that's really what you're pushing. If I gather correctly, with micro adventures is changing the perspective of what an adventure is 
and harnessing that same sort of thing that you would feel on one of your epic massive adventures without having to break the bank, without having to really travel too far from home and maybe even get it done before you go to work. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of people, hopefully people listening to this podcast, enjoy the idea of adventure. You know, they we're talking about crossing oceans and cycling across continents. And it's quite fun to listen to these sort of stories like, oh, that sounds great. But it's kind of also not really very helpful for real people in real lives with real jobs and real commitments and families and mortgages and all that sort of stuff. So mm. it struck me that there was a bit of a disconnect here between the number of people who like the idea of adventures versus those who have the opportunities to do it. So I wondered if I could somehow try and bridge the gap between the two to take all this good stuff of adventure that we all love and somehow make it compatible with busy real life to find short simple local affordable alternatives to the big adventures I was doing so what I've started to do was always was then was to just think what opportunities for adventure can you find in your day not what barriers are getting in the way so don't complain about oh I've got the nine to five job I can't do it ask yourself Well, what about the five to nine? When I finish work in the evening, what can I do until I have to go back to work the next morning? Maybe I can fit something in then. And don't think, oh, I haven't got enough money to row across the Atlantic, say. Instead think, oh, wow, I've got 50 bucks in my pocket. I wonder, maybe I could get a train to some place I've never been to a few hours away and walk home this weekend. What what advent, what advent opportunities are there, not what obstacles stand in the way? So yeah, my adventures um, over the last 10 years have just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then hopefully at the same time become more accessible and relatable to more people so that people not only enjoy hearing about adventures, but they now have more opportunities and fewer excuses not to go do them for themselves. When you're doing your podcast and you were asking people what it was like to live adventurously, uh, what was a common thread? Was there a common thread that you'd found? What was the thing that would drive people to want to live a more adventurous life? I think the people that I was speaking to were quite willing to go against the herd. So not just to do the stuff that society deemed was normal or expected so perhaps a a streak of um, individuality and eccentricity and a willingness to walk their own path and quite a strong awareness that time is very short and for all of us and yet well any of us who are listening to this podcast we're on the privileged end of global society and if we don't make the most of that incredible um, lottery winning ticket of birth, then it'd be a bit of a shame, really. So I think it's mm-hmm. about just not caring what other people think, being honest about what you personally feel is important and f- fulfilling and adventurous, and then making it happen because time is ticking. So um, yeah, time is ticking. That That's certainly something that has driven me to a lot of my projects is I have an idea and then I think, well, let's just get on with it because time is ticking. Do you keep that sense of mortality in your uh, your head at all times, a whole momento mori sort of concept? Well, um, as I was saying that then, I realized that I haven't sort of said that for a few years. And it certainly used to be a really big driver for me. But I think as I'm uh, mellowing, I'm getting more accepting and I'm less driven and ambitious, I think, than, than I was a bunch of years ago. But there's a fantastic website called deathclock.com. And you oh. type into it your your age, your gender, your height, your weight, whether or not you smoke, and it calculates for you the day that you will die, um, which is sort of depressing. But I personally find it really inspiring. And I actually have it in my calendar, my Google calendar of uh, on this date, I am uh, dead and all following dates. Um, and I put it in for a bit of a joke, but actually it's quite serious for me now. It's like anything that I want to get done... Be- has to get done before this date that's in my calendar because after that I'm I'm busy being dead for the rest <laughs> of the existing universe. So uh, it is the deadline. Do you remember what that date is off top of your head? It's alarmingly it's alarmingly soon. It's it's I don't remember the date, but it's it's much sooner than I would like it to be. Mm. You know, my grandfather died when he was fifty six. I never met him, but I saw pictures of him and. Oh, look at that old man, right? 56, it sounds like a good ripe old age to go. 
now that I'm getting older, I'm like, man, that was pretty young in the scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah, that's, able- that's scary, isn't it? Totally. Yeah, being able to um, get things accomplished while there's still light of day is definitely uh, uh, a motivator for many. Um, It's funny that you say that that was something that really sort of drove you, but you're starting to mellow and uh, it's not on your head as much. Is that because you feel you've gotten those key pieces accomplished or is it because your perspective on death is changing? Um. Well, just incidentally, while you're asking me that question, I quickly typed into my Google calendar, uh, death, <laughs> and I've got it scheduled in for the 8th of September, 2055. And it says, my death, day one. Uh, and then 9th of <laughs> September, my death, day two. So yeah, if you want to call me, you've got to do it before 8th of September, 2055, because I'm pretty busy after that, <laughs> being, being dead. <laughs> no kidding. Um, so I, th- I, think, I think things have changed for me through a conscious a conscious effort to try to make myself be less ambitious so my ambition has to become less ambitious to accept more that what i've got is good enough and to appreciate what i've got and to be tried to be driven by some of those sort of internal values rather than the external goals and targets of oh just one more adventure one more book blah 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 so it's been a conscious effort to just sort of slow down and accept what i have and that enough is enough. So a lot of people listening to this, I'm sure would be intrigued by the adventures that you've been on and intrigued by the fact that micro adventures maybe isn't something that's even been on their radar in the past, but they also might come up with some, you know, maybe you've seen it, some common barriers or misconceptions, misconceptions that might prevent them from embarking on a micro adventure. Have you seen many misconceptions or barriers that would prevent a person and how would you suggest they overcome that yes yeah, so i started to take micro adventures quite seriously um geez quite a long time ago 10 years more than 10 years ago and i'd send out some questionnaires to people like what's stopping you having adventures and i'd get you know hundreds and hundreds of replies to these so essentially the two big ones are a lack of time or a lack of money Generally in life, you either don't have enough time or you don't have enough money. There's generally a period for one of those two things. Um, Then um, a perceived lack of expertise. Oh, it's okay for you to have an adventure. Uh, I can't do that because I'm too young, too old, too thin, too heavy, too old, too... uh, I'm not fit enough. All these sorts of perceived Mm. things. Um, Whereas what I'm trying to emphasize with microventures is Do what you can with what you've got. Sure, you might not be able to climb Mount Everest, but for you, maybe climbing that hill that you can see from your office window that you've never been to before, maybe that's your personal version of Everest. So that's one thing. And then the fourth is um, geographical. So people think, oh, Mm. I can't have an adventure because I live in boring old Britain. If I only lived in Vancouver, then I'd have these wonderful adventures. (laughs) Whereas, of course, there'll be loads of people in Vancouver thinking, oh, boring old Canada. I've been here all my life. If only I could go to England, that'd be a real adventure. So trying to trying to get the, into your mind the idea that just try and seek wildness and nature close to where you live. Don't just wish that you lived in a log cabin in Patagonia. Just do what you can. Uh, so they're the they're the four chief things that I come up against time and again. But the two biggest by far are lack of time or lack of money. Mm. Isn't it funny? The, uh, the doctrine of distance. And we talk about that in mm-hmm. the, so I, I run a training company as well and talk about that in training and people will bring in an instructor from another province or another state going into the, uh, United States there. Well, they must be good. Cause look at how far they're coming from. Oh, but if you <laughs> get one from the UK, well, now we got, we got a heavy hitter now. Cause look at how far they've come. The doctrine of distance and the same thing applies to going on an adventure. It's like, Oh yeah. Look at, look at all these beautiful places that we've got posters on the wall of that. One day I'm going to get out and I'm going to check this out. And the amount of absolutely beautiful places that are right here in our backyard, when you just kind of look around a little bit is, is pretty crazy. Getting, I I think that's a really good uh, distinction that people can make is having that passion and joy in their hearts for something that is accessible. It's right here, right in your backyard. Mm. I, I think you're exactly right. I was talking um, 
to someone a, a while ago about how I've been exploring the local map that I live on and I've found interesting little things close to where I live. And this person said to me, yeah, that's fine. But where I live, I live in Kansas. This is so boring. There's nothing to see here. And I just said, I'd love, I've never been to Kansas. If you suddenly dropped me now in the middle of Kansas, I'd be so interested. I'm like, wow, look at this. There's, I don't know, giant cornfields or, I don't know, a, a cafe selling pancakes. I don't know what I'd find, mm -hmm. but that would be so interesting. But the very fact that he listened to me saying, there is interesting stuff where you live. And he'd said, yep, yep, that's true. But not for me, because where I live is boring. <laughs> uh, really, really struck me. That's funny. You know, uh, I haven't done it in a while and I probably should, but I used to go to the bookstore and I'd take a look at, um, uh, what were they like the lonely planet or they have things like Europe on a shoestring or all these different kind of travel books. And I'd look at ones for my area and I'd go through and I'd take notes of different things. And then I'd go out and I'd check that out because, you know, growing up, I had no money and that was, that was something that was fun. It was kind of neat, but you, it if I'm having a difficult time looking at it from a, an outsider's perspective, just go into those websites or go into those books. Cause when I was doing it, we didn't have websites, but, uh, uh, was something that helped me get out there. I did exactly the same thing. When I got home from cycling around the world, having just been in 60 countries and when I'm in a foreign country, I find everything interesting. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Look, look how the supermarkets work. Oh, so interesting. The school buses are yellow in this country. I'm just, I find everything interesting in other countries. And when I get home, I'm like, blah, home, blah. So when I got home from cycling around the world, one of the first things I did was buy the Lonely Planet Guide to Britain and the Lonely Planet Guide to London for exactly the same reasons as you just said, to make myself remember to be curious and have that curious traveler's eye right here at home. One thing that I found and maybe you found the same thing is when traveling particularly traveling solo i love to to travel solo just because you learn a lot about yourself and you can learn a lot about things and be put into situations that you might not otherwise be put in if you're in a group but the number of people that would reach out and say oh hey um you need a place to stay i got a place you can come to to my place and stay tonight oh what are you doing for dinner tonight my treat come on out i, I just want to practice English. And I was always a little suspect and I'd tend to say, no, 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 I'm fine. Even though again, broke, I would save money on accommodations by sleeping on trains or finding a little place where I could uh, make a little camp. And so that way I'd have some money to be able to pay for those trains or pay for the food, but you wouldn't find that same sort of interaction in our own backyard. It's not like I walk around Vancouver and people are like, oh, you look hungry, hungry or you want a place to stay? And you get this idea that people where I'm at aren't friendly. People where I'm at just aren't as open. But maybe, maybe it's you. Have you found this? So I've got a really good example of exactly this dilemma. Uh, so... Um, one of my earliest micro adventures, actually, although now I look back, it's actually quite big for a micro adventure. But I decided to walk right the way around London. There's a, a road, a big motorway, a big freeway that goes in a circle around London called the M25. It's full mm -hmm. of traffic. It goes through endless, boring suburbia. Everyone hates it. And I decided to walk a lap of it to try and show that you can find adventure anywhere. And hey, maybe there's some beauty along the way. So um, I did that in January. It was snowy and cold, but I had quite a big rucksack backpack on with my tent. I was camping along the way. So I'd get to these completely ordinary English towns, the sort of places that I've spent, I'm in all the time. But suddenly I'd be walking into the cafe or the pub with my huge backpack on and my tent. And like suddenly I looked different. I was an yes. interesting, exotic arrival. And suddenly people were like, hey, stranger, tell us where you're from. Tell me your story. Here, <laughs> let me buy you breakfast. Uh, it's really cold outside tonight. Why don't you put your tent up in my garden? The sort of stuff that never happens to me normal in Britain. But because I was suddenly different, I was an adventurer, I was on a journey, people responded to that. Um, so yeah, that was an exact test of the the theory you just you just mentioned. That's really cool. For, for me, that's uh, one of the coolest things about, about traveling is just meeting the people, seeing the cultures and being open to those sort of experiences, being able to have that in your own backyard, man, that's pretty cool. So are you able to share 
a personal micro adventure that was uh, ex- impactful for you, meaningful for you? Was there one that really stands out? Well, that was certainly the walking around London was a really pivotal one for me because I I um I did it to try and prove one point, and the point I was trying to prove was that. You don't need to go to the end of the world to have some sort of physical challenge and a bit of an adventure. And, I, and and it was interesting in that regard. But at the same time, I did kind of think it was going to be a pretty ugly, fairly boring sort of journey through boring suburban towns. Um, mm. And they, it's true. I mean, there are a lot of boring, ugly suburban towns. But what I realized on this walk was that between these towns are fields and little rivers and bits of woodland and stuff which I'd never noticed before. Because in the car, you just zoom from one town to the next. And I hadn't no I hadn't seen these things because I'd not been looking for them. And they that made me realise that there was much more nature and wildness, even in a fairly built up place like southeast of England, than I'd ever realised before. And that then got me uh into the idea of wow, I can find rivers to swim in, or hills to camp in, or or woods to go running in. I can find these everywhere. I really don't need to go all the way to um, Alberta to to find a bit of peace and wilderness. <laughs> now, there's always going to be those that are risk adverse, or those who don't want to go out into the wild because they figure there's going to be a bear there. They don't want to swim in the ocean because they figure there will be a shark in there. And Maybe they live in an area where sharks or bears are around, but even if they are, the odds are really in their favor that they're going to be just fine. Um, do you find that that is an obstacle for people? Like, and it's particularly in a micro adventure because all of a sudden they're unknown or that the scary thing might be, might be other people, might be urban dangers. Is that something that you've encountered or an objection you've heard from people? Yeah, that's an absolutely enormous one. Um, and what what I think people tend to neglect in their thinking is they worry, oh, if I go out and uh, swim in this river, then a shark might eat me and that would be really mm. bad. And they, and they worry about that. But people don't pause to think that if I don't swim in that river, then I will miss out on that joyful experience of having swum in the river and my life will be slightly diminished because of that so people don't seem to, to and to me that seems like a really big risk that, that I mean that's really risking my life that it's I'm making my life worse by not swimming in that river and what a tragedy that is because I've got my death in my calendar so I'd better get on and swim in that river so I think I think there is that aspect to it um but I think though also to be fair to to be maybe kinder to people there's um there's an an a nervousness about the unknown and I think that I sometimes downplay that because I've been lucky enough to have spent many years actively pursuing the unknown and and sort of choosing uncertainty and I didn't find that easy at first I was often very nervous and worried but uh, but then I felt great when I had done that pushed myself to do that and I think like any sort of exercise you flex the muscle and it grows so so I, I do now have quite a lot of confidence that I quite happily land in any country in the world or wander into any wood and I'd have an interesting time so I've got the habit of that so what I would encourage people who sort of like the idea but have too many negative um, worries is to just think of a smaller option so you you're, you don't want to go sleep on that hill for the night because it's a bit scary so okay don't just do nothing shrink it down maybe sleep in your backyard for the night which sounds kind of silly but I used to love doing that when I was a child just sleeping outside and you know I've done it now as an adult and I feel a bit silly just taking my bedding out from my house and lying (laughs) down in my in my backyard it feels a bit silly but actually once you're there you know you see the stars you can hear the birds in the trees and the wind blowing and things and in many ways you're getting let's say 80% 80% of the benefits of a wilderness camping experience, but only having had to go two meters from your front door with the benefit that if it rains, you can just go inside and go back to bed. So the good, so then you do that, someone does that, they'll think, oh, that was good. I've, I enjoyed that. It's worth me being a bit bolder to try something a bit braver next time. So I think if something seems too daunting and difficult, rather than doing nothing, just try and find a smaller, shorter, simpler option until you can overcome your internal worries about it. It's brilliant. You know, I got to imagine that 
I'm, I'm trying to put myself into your mental headspace prior to cycling around the world. I'm trying to put myself in your mental headspace prior to rowing across the Atlantic. I would think that the uh, trepidation of rowing across the Atlantic would be higher than the trepidation of embarking on a cycling trip across the world. Is that is that fair, or would you say that there's maybe equal but different uh, um, thoughts going through your head? Yeah, I'd, I would say they're very, very different feelings, that really. So my, my worries about going around the world were really about getting murdered by horrible, scary foreigners, because I'd learned mm. from, read, from reading the newspapers and watching the TV news, I knew that foreigners in all these other countries were horrible scary people so that was my that was my worry really before I started cycling and then of course once I actually started visiting these foreign countries I realized that everyone was just nice and normal like they were back home and what on earth was all the fuss about so my worries about um cycling around the world were very much premeditated no not what they were done before the before the trip and they were totally Mm. and utterly wrong um, my fears about rowing the Atlantic were more uh, about uh, you know, falling off the boat in the night and drowning or getting capsizing in a huge storm and falling off the boat and drowning. And and, and that then led on to the notion of um, perceived dangers versus actual dangers. Because the mm. reality is when you're rowing across the Atlantic, as long as you keep your safety harness on and you keep clipped onto the safety line, you're pretty safe. You know, you're not going to fall off off the boat and drown. And then if you just sat in the boat for a few months, eventually you would drift across the ocean to the other side. So the perceived risks were high, but the actual dangers were quite low. And I think that's a sign of a good adventure, something that gets you wor- worried and nervous. But actually, you've, if you plan it and do it properly, is actually quite a safe thing because adventurous people love being alive. So you don't want to do mm. something reckless and stupid and die. So um uh, yeah, they were very different exper- very different things I was worried about. See, I would find, and this is perfect segue into where I'm going with this, and you probably uh, saw where I was going with that to begin with. But you know, I would find, like at a young age, I I would look at these rivers and look at the white water, and man, that's kind of scary. And how can someone go through that? But you know, maybe I'll just go on the real side of the water and I'll try swimming down beside the the white water. And I did that and maybe I'll put a little inflatable boat in and I'll go down. Hey, that wasn't too bad. Maybe I'll row it out into the center. And all of a sudden I'm getting a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more comfortable. And I ended up, uh, rafting most of the, uh, the major navigable rivers around here, uh, ended up purchasing a whitewater raft, a commercial one after almost drowning a couple of times. Uh, prior to that, it was a $20 Canadian tire, which is an out- outdoor story all across chain store over here. And uh, no life jacket. Maybe I had a few beers and a backpack tied to it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, then it was a World War II inflatable that uh, purchased at a at a gun show that we ended up having to make. We called it a shower cap, so that because uh, we ripped the bottom out of it, and so we had a, a bit of a bucket boat. But always progressing up and up. But there is this feeling prior to going in that I would have even going into the uh, side of the water when I was because I was never a great swimmer, which I've learned to overcome. But when I just kind of swam or floated down the side, there is those nerves. Then when I start going out into the bigger white water or start swimming through that, there's those nerves and eventually you get more used to it. So I guess this whole roundabout question statement is, do you still get that on micro adventures? No, not really. So okay. Micro, I love micro adventures, uh, but this and they they act as a substitute for a lot of adventurous type stuff in my life. But mm. no, they don't. They they don't do that for me. So they, I don't get that side of uh, the adventuring from doing the small local things. Mm. But well, an, an interesting, um, well, maybe interesting. You can decide if this is interesting. I realised <laughs> that I, over over doing lots of expedition things, you start to become comfortable with it. You start to become competent. You realise you're probably going to you if you do things sensibly, you're going to get from A to B and you'll succeed. And I started to realise that perhaps in my own way, these adventures were actually not that adventurous. They were almost just me in my comfort zone, just sticking to what I'm good at mm-hmm. and maybe to get back to that 
fear and adrenaline and the uncertainty. I needed to really look differently at adventure. So I um I decided to retrace the one of my favourite books, a book from the 1930s about this young British guy who walks through Spain playing his violin to earn money along the way. I can't play the violin at all, but I decided this is what I'm going to do. I had six months of violin lessons. I sounded like a strangled cat. It was horrible, but I spent a month walking through Spain with no money, no credit card, and only the violin to earn me some money. And I personally found standing up in little village plazas, little squares to play the violin, absolutely terrifying, at least as terrifying as rowing the Atlantic Ocean. But um, but it was a different way of trying to get that uncertainty and fear. And and I think I think a good example of how we can all address what adventurous living means in quite different ways. I really like that example. You know, and you're right. I mean, you start setting these goals and these adventures and you find yourself in your comfort zone. People would say, wow, you're rafting these big rivers. Isn't that an adrenaline uh, ex- exercise? No, no, it's actually really, really relaxing. And it's really, it's really the opposite of adrenaline. Every once in a while, you find yourself in a bit of a predicament and there might be a short stint of, uh, okay, we need some action quick here, but no, it's extremely relaxing. But in that same breath, um, I also found I was getting complacent as I went out and I kept pushing myself and I would push that whole risk reward envelope a bit more just so I could kind of get that feeling. Is that something that you've experienced? Yeah, absolutely. And it is actually one of the chief reasons why I decided to reconsider adventure adventure and to think about, hey, perhaps playing the violin is an adventure yeah. or perhaps um, encouraging people to sleep on a hill. That's adventure because the, the, uh, the line you're pursuing there just eventually is going to lead to disaster. If you keep just pushing mm-hmm. and pushing and pushing, eventually you're going to go jump off a higher and higher cliff until eventually it goes wrong. So uh, I didn't want to just be heading down that route and I prefer to just try and start trying to think a bit more laterally about the way I was going to go about things. So one question I've asked myself is at what point am I being smart and at what point am I being kind of chicken and, and not living? And that's always that little thing that I'm kind of, um, uh, juggling with, like, I want to push, I want to live. You want to do these exciting things. You know, I've got a family, I've got a couple kids, they depend on me. I got to make sure I do things in a smart way. So where is that balance in the same breath? I don't want to be living a life that's risk adverse and teaching my children to be risk adverse. Cause I think that's the worst thing that I could possibly do for them. Is that something that you juggle with? Absolutely. And there's a very fine line between recklessness and bravery, very fine line. The trouble is that you don't know where the line is until you've gone across it. And uh, mm. yeah, inc- increasingly, again, perhaps as I'm just becoming an old man, I just felt that that <laughs> pushing that line eventually was just going to lead to something bad happening. And, and, and the rewards for pushing that line diminish as well. And, and, and also I've done it quite a few times. Perhaps it might be more interesting to have a look at different ways of going about things. So yeah, step consciously stepping away from that route was a, has been a conscious choice. Have you had close calls? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not, not really, and not many, to be honest. Mm. Um, so um, I got mugged at gunpoint in Siberia, but then the guy, once I'd given him my wallet, uh, I was lost. So I then got out my map, and he helped me navigate back to where I was wanting to go. So there's some, there's some good in, good, good sides in everyone. Um, and uh, so, sorry, pa- sorry, can what, you say that? Can you say that one again? You were mugged at gunpoint, and the same guy yeah. helped you. Yeah, so I was in uh, Siberia in the in the winter time on my bike. It was very cold. It was dark, minus forty degrees, and uh, um, a car stopped. Um, a very um, a couple of very drunk guys got out. One of them's uh, waving his gun around. Give me your money. Give me your money. So of course you give them some money. Uh, I had a little de- I had a sort of decoy wallet for exactly this circumstance with a, a little bit of money and just a sort of 
uh, appease them. And he's like, oh, great, I've got your money. And then I'm like, oh, excuse me, while, uh, while, while you're taking my wallet, can you um, give me some directions? So I got the map out. And then the Russian people, when I cycled through Russia, were so kind, generally, that he was like, oh, yeah, and he's helped with the navigation and they got into the car and drove off with my wallet. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I found that a very interesting human experience. <laughs> that, yeah, that is funny. <laughs> I think you're going to say, you're going to give another example there before I cut you off. Well, the other example is, is more um, very much from your sort of world, really. When I was um, crossing Iceland by pack raft and there was a stretch of white water rapids, which looked definitely looked beyond my skill level i was with a friend at the time canadian guy actually and we were wrecking the route and walking up and down and we had kind of had that gut feeling of mm, this is beyond us we shouldn't do it and then i sort of uttered the immortal words of think how great this will look on youtube uh-huh. <laughs> which then got which then got my vanity and my ego going and i so i decided to pack craft it the moment i got into the current i realized i was totally totally out of my skill level and I flipped and it was terrifying and uh, absolutely horrific. I managed to get to the shore and then I was frantically blowing on my little whistle to stop Chris coming down the river afterwards. <laughs> and I learned I learned an important lesson then. I also had forgotten to press go on the camera, so I didn't even oh, get it man. on YouTube. But it proved to me a really important lesson that I've used many times since, which is, would I do this thing if nobody else found out about it? i.e. am I doing this adventure for myself or am I doing it to show off later on YouTube? So again, is this an intrinsic thing driven by me or is it an external sort of validation that I'm after? So yeah, don't do stuff just to look good on YouTube. Do it for the gram, right? No, that's, exactly. that's really good advice. Did you know in your gut before going through there that this wasn't a good idea? Yes, yes, I definitely did. And then I certainly did within about five seconds of paddling out into the current. Um, yeah, That's fine. That, the way, it was just way, way, I was completely, yeah. And then, as you will well know, once you're out in the middle of the current, you're in it. <laughs> you kind of got to go for it, yeah. You know, I, uh, I remember I had a, uh, this is prior to getting the commercial whitewater raft, and there is a local river around here that's that's run commercially, but the commercial guys weren't running it at this point because I guess it was a bit too rough. And I was doing promotions for a, a Corona beer a company that brought in Corona beer. So had this Jeep all deckled out in Corona stuff and they give you a digital camera and which was brand new kind of stuff at the time. And they were giving away this uh, inflatable boat all deckled out with Corona stuff on there. And I thought maybe I'll just borrow this boat and I'll take it down the river and anyways, we drive out to the river. I'm there with a buddy of mine. He's got the digital camera. Um, he looks, he says, I'm not doing this. This is, this is too, it's too rough. The water is going too fast. And, uh, there's kayakers that came in that we're looking at and they're like, yep, yeah, no, we're not doing this. And I look over at my buddy. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is as safe as I've ever seen it because I started getting of this mindset that, like quite often when it looks really bad, it isn't bad. And it's these things that don't look bad are the things you kind of got to watch out for. Like when you see the water bubbling up and down and over, generally you'll be like a cork and you can float over all of that. It's strainers and um, recirks and these sort of things that you kind of have to watch out for. Anyways, I said, tell you what, I'm going to put in, in the roughest area of this, I'm going to show you how safe this is. And then once I've convinced you of this, we'll, we'll just go down the river in, in the, in the less rough area. Anyways, I'm walking down the, the side, the river side to get into the river. He's got the camera. He's got to take pictures all the way through. And for whatever reason, like, you know, I was raised Catholic. I wouldn't say I'm a religious guy, but for whatever reason, I do a sign of the cross before getting into the, uh, into the river. And I think deep down, I knew in my head that what I was doing was stupid. But, you know, young, dumb, ego, all the rest. And so I look at it. I, I scout my line that I'm going to take. I got these goofy little oars on the, on this uh, inflatable boat and get them all set up. I've actually got a life jacket on now because uh, another company had given me a life jacket. We used to put in where the commercial guys put in and we'd try and follow them so we could see the safe way to go. And maybe their safety kayakers would take pity if we if we got into trouble and they'd rescue us. Anyways, I, I put in, same as you, 
way too fast. It was cold. The boat deflates a bit. Um, immediately the paddles are not worth anything and I'm hands and feet trying to paddle over to get on my line. I don't make it to my line. I'm sucked into a recirc. Then I'm sucked into a bigger recirc afterwards. I end up losing the boat. I almost lost my life. I remember I'm passing out, I guess, because you're losing oxygen was your, you know, they say, don't panic. I didn't feel like I was panicking. I just felt like I was working as hard as I could to get up and out. I'm making every letter of the alphabet, trying to touch some green water to pull me out because the white water is so aerated. Anyways, my buddy's standing on the rock taking pictures. He's like, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't jump in and help you. There's nothing I could do. The only thing going through my head was if you don't make it on this one, the camera's going in the river too, because I don't want to be the guy who took pictures of his buddy drowning on the river. Anyways, I uh, ended up getting spit out. I was going to swim over to the other side where the my line was and where my head was. And I looked over to my left and I said, nope closer. I'm going to swim as hard as I can. I won't give up until I get to shore. And despite all of that, the second that my body got into an area where it was calmer and I wasn't really affected by the flow of the river, it collapsed. And my buddy drags me out and I'm throwing up water and coughing out water. But, uh, yeah, funny, funny. Um, yeah, how that works. Yeah. There's, I think there's a good reason that women live longer than men. They are less stupid that's it and that's all it is and again it was ego we didn't have instagram we didn't have youtube at the time but uh but we had a digital camera <laughs> these pictures are gonna look good <laughs> so oh well oh man <laughs> um is there anything else that we should be talking about about your new book about micro adventures is there anything that we should be uh letting people know about that we haven't already yeah i guess i guess i'd like to um just explain a bit how I went from these massive, big global adventures onto small micro adventures, trying to encourage people to just get out at the weekend to what I've been spending the last year doing, which is going even smaller and more local than ever to, I committed to trying to spend just one year on the small map that I live on. I, in Britain, we've got these little, these sort of hiking maps. Um, they, they um, measure about 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers, a really small area. And I decided to go out once a week to explore a single one kilometer grid square. So one kilometer by one kilometer, try and see everything in that square once a week, what would happen. And I was a bit worried that I might be a bit bored doing it and a bit claustrophobic. But I soon realized that there was just once you slow down and pay attention and be curious and decide consciously decide that I'm going to be interested in everything then suddenly everything becomes interesting and um, what I thought was going to be quite a boring year turned into one of the most fascinating uh, journeys and learning experiences of my life so I'm on a big mission at the moment to get everyone to just buy the local map for where they live and go out and find what adventure and wildness is right on your doorstep within a few miles of where you live it's been a really eye-opening experience it, you know my wife got me into foraging um I wasn't really into it she loves gardening foraging all the rest and she's like there's this guy He's got a book out. He's got a few books out. Hank Shaw. And we're meeting up with him, actually. We're going to go down to California, Sierra Nevada mountain range, and he's going to do some foraging with them. So we went out, we did that, and it started really opening my eyes to, like, we went out in the forest, we're doing morels, looking at wild onions and garlics, and we we're uh, pine nuts. And, and in your head, you're like, okay, you got to go to these exotic places and you look at all these cool things that you can forage. But then when I started becoming a bit more aware, you can make salads out of stuff you find growing out of your sidewalk right by your house. And this, this sounds like a very similar sort of a, uh, an analogy. What would, can you walk me through what a day in adventuring locally, that micro local adventure would look like? Yeah, so so I was limited to this one kilometer by one kilometer, and I would try to go and see every footpath or um, hiking trail on there, or some, quite often they were towns. So then I'd try and cycle down every single street within this little area. But the countryside ones, it's interesting you mentioned the the forager as a sort of teacher to open your eyes because I was doing this on my own, but I used an app 
called Seek made by iNaturalist. And it's one of those apps where you point it at a plant and it tells you the name of what you're mm. what you're seeing. And then suddenly we're like, ah, I learned the name of this thing. And then you start to see it all over the place. And I'd come home late and Google it and realize, hey, you can put that into a salad. So exactly like you, te- but here teaching myself through an app was starting to learn about all this nature around me, which I'd spent my entire life ignoring because I just thought Britain was boring and I needed to go to the ends of the world to have an adventure. So yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was an exercise in slowing down. I try and take lots of photos and try and take really nice artistic photos, again, just to make me pay attention, to notice things, to look mm-hmm. at things in different ways. So, you know, maybe I'd find a car that had been burned out and the police had been and put a tape around, like police have been here. And I'd t- try and take beautiful photos of stuff like that as well, just to make myself be interested in, in everything. And the more you become interested in stuff, the more you find there's even more to learn and even more to learn. And suddenly one small kilometer started to feel absolutely enormous. And one small map felt way too big for a single year of exploration. So yeah, it was a really interesting self-educational experience, I guess. That approach sounds like ADHD heaven. There's always new things. There's always new hobbies. There's always new uh, (laughs) avenues that you can start exploring. Speaking of apps, have you tried geocaching? Yeah, geocaching is along the same sort of lines, isn't it? Of it, it, it's just an excuse to go somewhere you've never been before and to pay attention and be curious. And then you get excited, you find a little plastic tub with some little bits of rubbish in. It's not the reward, isn't that, is it? The reward is going somewhere new, um, and that's a very similar sort of spirit to uh, to what I was doing with my maps. Yeah, I think geocaching is a brilliant thing for people to take their kids to do, isn't it? Just to get them out into the outdoors. Oh, totally. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Maybe you find it, maybe you don't. Maybe someone's moved it, but at the very least, you're outside or you're in a different area, maybe in a little urban area outside. Um, Are there other apps that you use? You mentioned that Seek app. Yeah, Seek was brilliant. The other one that I found fantastic is called Merlin. And Merlin listens to birdsong and tells you the name of what you're listening to and i i always like bird song of course it's it's kind of nice to hear birds but suddenly i'm like oh wow that's a a chiff chaff and then i google it and it's like a tiny little thing that weighs six grams and it's flown all the way from africa to be in england to be in this little bush in the park I'm like, wow that's incredible i just heard it going chiff chaff chiff chaff never paid any attention and then (laughs) now i learned the name of i learned the name of this little dude and suddenly i care about it so yeah merlin has been really good that's a cool one. Yeah, Merlin makes me, is reminiscent of that old uh, handheld game. I don't know if you guys ever had that one. It's a little, looks like a red telephone. My grandparents had one and he press the buttons. He can play tic-tac-toe or all the different, anyways, that uh, Merlin. I think you're right? showing your age now, Travis. Maybe, maybe I'm getting older here, I tell you. Um, <laughs> gray hairs are starting to come out. Well, we'll make sure to get links to, uh, obviously to your book, to your website, uh, anything else we should be linking to that we'll throw up in the description here for everyone. No, that would be great. So I've just written a book about spending a year close to home that I've called local. So I think, yeah, local would be, I'd love it if people would read local. Um, then obviously I've written micro adventures and I've written books about, uh, cycling around the world. I've also written books for children. Uh, one about cycling around the world and I turned my story of rowing the Atlantic into a kid's book called The Girl Who Rode the Ocean because I think we need more books about girls having crazy adventures. Yeah, yeah, I agree because there's lots of girls out there that have crazy adventures. That's what, you know, I'm, I'm watching your feed and I'm liking how you put the reviews up, good and bad. And I'm finding that no, humorous. Not, not good. I don't really bother with the good ones, but I, yeah, I put on Instagram, I use the hashtag not very glowing book reviews and I read out my one star terrible reviews. (laughs) It's a very different approach, a very refreshing approach to what you typically find on social media. And you took the same approach with uh, podcasting. So when I first started this podcasting, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd been on one podcast. I listened to one podcast live. But aside from that, I've never listened to a podcast. So I got my recorder. I got things set up. I had a couple of friends. We start recording. 
and I would edit every um, every awe, every, and I'd try and make it clean and professional, the amount of work and effort that I put into it. And I found after a while that there, not only is that a heck of a lot of work, but that level of perfectionism that you're trying to put in detracts from the realism and from the heart of what you're trying to put out there. And I find the same sort of thing. When you did your podcast, even your first one, you're giving your intro and you had to start again and go through it and say it. And you said, you just left it all in. I thought that's refreshing. Just like we put <laughs> the not so glowing book reviews. That's refreshing. Is that something that you find is, uh, you've had to learn to do, or is that just something you've always done? No, I, it's very much a learned thing to try and be grown up and brave enough to say to the world, hey, I'm not perfect or I'm not very good at this, but I'm trying my best. And um, and weirdly, the more you admit your weaknesses, the more they kind of become superpowers. So when I played my violin through Spain, if you look on YouTube, my Midsummer Morning on YouTube, you'll see how I'm really bad. I'm not just being British polite. I was terrible. <laughs> but that weakness, what I'm being brave enough to just say to the people of Spain, I'm really bad, but I'm going to try my best. People responded to that and they gave me money. I was sucked, but people were still giving me money. So yeah, just daring yourself to admit to the world, I'm not perfect. And then actually sort of becomes a weird superpower. I like that a lot. Do your best every day. Don't worry about the blemishes. We all got them. And in fact, sometimes it's what my wife would always tell me, and I try so hard to make something perfect. She's like, perfect isn't beautiful. Yeah. It can, so I should so just today, um, I was looking down someone's Instagram feed and all the pictures were so beautiful and they all had the same sort of color palette. Uh, mm. I just thought, man, this is so boring, mm -hmm. really boring. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, I agree with that. P perfect can be a bit boring. Yeah. Perfect isn't beautiful. Maybe I wonder if she's saying something about me there. <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> um, I don't know how to take that now. All right. Well, Alistair, uh, anything else we should touch on? No, I think uh, ending on your lack of beauty and your imperfection sounds an ideal way to wrap this up. I like that. Alistair, thank you so much for being on the Silver Core podcast. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Likewise, it's been good fun. Thank you. Thank you.